Welcome to episode 308 of CPP Cast, the first podcast for C developers by C developers. I'm your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? I'm all right, Rob. How are you doing? Doing good. You know, summer, doing well. I don't know. You, you got anything going on? <laughs> Uh, well, at the moment, we have um, more smoke than I would like to see from various forest fires. It certainly was worse last year, but waking up in the mornings, like it's hard to open your eyes because of all the allergens and stuff. But uh, otherwise, it's doing well. That's good. That's good. Hopefully, uh, that gets cleaned up soon and taken care of. Yeah. Yeah, we keep getting like forecast for rain, but n- it never actually happens. So that's unfortunate. Yeah. Okay. Well, at the top of every episode, I like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, we got this message on Discord from Jack saying, I'd be interested in hearing from Robert Nystrom. He wrote two books that are freely available, and he's currently working on the Dart language at Google, I believe. It would be interesting to hear about his take on language design and evolution. Uh, he's also worked in the games industry, so has undoubtedly used C++ a bunch. And that also has a link to uh, Robert's blog, which is journal.stuffwithstuff.com. You know, I, I find that interesting. He's worked a lot in the games industry, so undoubtedly as you see C++ a bunch. And I don't think I've ever shared this on CVP cast, mm-hmm. but uh, from time to time, I will attend the local C++, dev- excuse me, the local game developer group okay. in Denver. And the last time I attended it, uh, it was virtual. And I mentioned, oh, I'm a C++ developer, whatever. And um, all of the other attendees were like, does anyone still use C++ for game development? And I'm mm-hmm. like, what alternate universe did I just step into? <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing if it's like hobbyist game programmers, maybe they're, they're all using indie game devs. In indie games, they're doing. Um, you know, they're not going to be using the triple A, you yeah, know, tools C-sharp that with larger Unity studios, or, right? Yeah. They're using Unity. They're not using like Unreal Engine, which is C++, I believe. It was so bizarre, though, to have them all respond that way. And I'm like, from the C++ yeah. perspective, everyone thinks that that's the only thing C++ is used for. <laughs> like, yeah, it's funny, though. You would think they would at least be aware that even if they're not using C++, that is what's being used in games. Not at all. Games. Yeah, huh. that's fascinating. Although, to be fair, some other people from the local indie games community are involved in my C++ meetup. So it was like I had just gone there on the exact right day or something. Right, right. OK, well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or emails at feedback at cpcast.com. And don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube. Joining us today is Evica Bogoshevic. Evica is a senior software engineer with 10 years of experience active in the domain of Linux and bare metal-based embedded systems. His professional focus is application performance improvement, techniques used to make your C++ program run faster, by using better algorithms, better exploiting the underlying hardware, and better usage of the standard library programming language and the operating system. He is founder of Johnny Software Lab, a consulting company that helps developers and development teams increase the performance of their software. He's also a writer for a performance-related tech blog, uh, Johnny Software Lab. Ivica, welcome to the show. Hello, thank you. I'm so curious how you ended up with the name Johnny Software Lab as the founder of this uh, company. So, uh, so my name is Ivica, it's just translation into English, uh, Johnny. So it, oh. there is a John and Ivan, and Ivica is just the diminutive of that name. Okay. And so uh, because I was, I was playing a lot with software, so it was like an experiment. And it all started like experiment. So it's like the English, English, Englishization of your yeah. name. <laughs> there, there are many people who... Uh, uh, who, when moved to US, they they get their name translated. I think there is one one, uh, you know, Nikola Tesla. So yeah. he didn't get his name translated. But there is the, the other guy who is called Mikhailo Pupin, and I think his name is in English was Michael. Uh, and he was a really he was a Serbian. He was really, I mean, fa- Nikola Tesla is a special guy. I mean, he was like if you meet him, you would be really shocked maybe he was all about himself and his work and the other guy Mikhailo Pupin um, uh, he was uh, he was um, really open the cordial man and he was he wrote a book in English about how he made uh, 
how he made a, not a fortune, but how he made his fame starting from a small village in Serbia and then he moved in Austro-Hungary and then he moved to to the United States. It's a great book. It's a good book because it's a it shines with positivity. You know, you you read it and you feel you feel better about it. You feel better about life and about yourself. That's a good book. Yeah, that's it's. I don't like reading things where you feel worse about the world when you're done. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, Avica, we got a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and we'll start talking uh, more about you know performance and, and the types of topics you talk about on your blog. Okay. Okay. All right. So this first one, we have a uh, GitHub repo, and this is Open 3D Engine, which is a open source, real time, multi platform 3D engine, and I believe this is a fairly new project. Uh, I think it was Amazon driven. It was you actually did a, a video about this recently, right? It was Amazon's Lumberyard, which we've mentioned okay. previously on the show, but renamed and open sourced. Okay. So, I mean, all game engines are, I think, number one, number one important thing for, 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 for performance developers because, mm -hmm. you know, if you don't have the, those 30 frames per second, you cannot chip your game. And they have like a completely uh, their methodology is completely something different that you will you will normally meet in C plus uh, plus standard C plus plus development and the standard object oriented paradigm. Um, so we're looking forward to I'm looking forward to see what will happen with that engine and I hope it will become as successful as it is as Unreal Engine is right now. So I okay. Uh, I was just going to say it'd be a little bit of a game changer if there was a fully open source AAA game engine out there. Uh, yo, okay, you're looking that from other perspective. I I guess that's important too. <laughs> <laughs> Did, does this mention like any actual games that are out there that have been made using this project? Um, on the main website, it okay. shows examples. The o3de.org, the one link that we have in the show notes is to the GitHub project. Um, yeah, like I see some screenshots from a game. I'm not sure what games have actually been. Uh, yeah, uh, good question. I'll have to look into that. Well, and what was you, you mentioned Lumberyard, which I guess we have talked before on the show. When did that? Um, how long has Lumberyard been around? I don't recall. It's been a while. Okay. Uh, so I will say, you know, I've done a few of these where I review some project mm -hmm. that's been recently open sourced on my videos just because it's a fun thing to do. And, and you know, honestly, it's a little bit of clickbait because if it's something that's in the public eye at the moment, then I'm going to get more people coming to the channel. Uh, for the first time ever though, I had four developers on the project respond on Twitter, including the lead developer. <laughs> for the oh, wow. games technology at Amazon. They're like, thanks for your feedback. We hope in a few months we can uh, you can come back and see all the progress we've made on the game engine. <laughs> oh, very cool. Well, yeah, maybe we can uh, have them on sometime too. Yeah. OK, uh, next thing we have is a blog post uh, on 60fps.io. And this is doc tools for C++ libraries. Um, and this is a GUI toolkit, uh, 60 FPS, and they have uh, done some analysis on you know what they what would be the best uh, documentation library for their usage. And uh, I'm not. I think we probably have talked about some of these before. We've definitely talked about Doxygen before, but um, the other two are Hide and Standard Ease that they kind of review in this post, uh, and then they go talk about Doxygen combined with uh, Breathe, Exhale, and Sphinx which is what they ultimately wound up using as the most, um, you know, best tool for generating documentation for C++. Do you have any thoughts on this, Avisa? Oh, I'm a standard user, so normally CPP. CPP um, so about the documentation, I mean, document API should always be simple enough so you, you, you can understand it, and that's the goal. A documentation, I really find it uh, Especially that kind of auto-generated documentation really gets, I mean, we all share that, really gives you the information you need. You always, if you go to the C++ uh, 
um, that website C plus what's the name of it? CPP reference. CPP reference. Yeah, CPP reference. Uh, you always scroll down to see the code example because that <laughs> that where you actually understand what what the thing is doing. So all the description there is just for for reference, let's say, and two or three diagrams which explain how the API should it should be used are most of the time, most of the time enough. I did find the um, hide tool sounded interesting because that is written in C++ and uh, it just generates everything from like your header files. And I think it then allows you to edit it if you want to add like examples or just additional information that it can't generate from the header files itself. But that sounded like an interesting well, tool. And I thought the standard ease one sounded familiar, so I went and checked mm -hmm. it out. And it's uh, started by Jonathan Mueller with contributions right. from Manu Sanchez and Tristan Brindle. And I'm like, wait a minute, these are all people we've had on the <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Not all of them, several of them. John McFarlane, mm -hmm. Victor Zuberovich. Yeah. All right, uh, next thing we have is the CPPCon 2021 call for submissions. And this went out a couple of weeks ago, but I guess we haven't actually mentioned it before on the podcast, even though we have I don't think uh, we have, mentioned yeah. some recent CPPCon news, like we mentioned the, um, the, the trip. Yeah, and I wanted to get this out here real quick because the end for the submissions deadline is the 19th. So that will be like, two days after this episode goes live, basically. So if you're listening to this and you haven't made your CVPCon submission, go ahead and do that. You can do um, both virtual virtual or uh, in-person submissions, and they will pay for your travel if you're allowed to travel to America in October. <laughs> right. right. Nice. You, you went to CPP or gave a, a talk at CPP now, is that right? You have any plans yeah, to yeah. Uh, submit for this? Yeah, yeah, and I, I have submitted for CPPCon. I'm looking awesome. forward to it. First, it's a really famous conference. There are a huge amount of really experts who know this stuff. I never went there, so it would be a great opportunity to see other people, see how other people think, see meet other people. So I'm looking forward if my talk gets accepted. So you're trying to do an in-person talk? Yep. Nice. OK, and then last thing we have is um, Meeting C++ announcing a second set of Ask Me Anythings for Meeting C++ 2021. Uh, and that'll include Sean Parent, Daniela Engert, and Kevlin Henley, Henny, who we've all had on the show before. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, these AMAs, I'm sure, are a lot of fun to be able to ask uh, you know, anything of these speakers, prominent speakers. OK. Uh, so you, you mentioned a little bit about how, uh, you know, you came to name Johnny Software Lab. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about the blog and how you got it started and everything? So uh, I, I'm in software development for 10 years and mostly doing embedded stuff. And from time to time, there is a, there's some performance related problem. I mean, everybody has those problems from time to time. And normally I really enjoy that problems and I'm good at this low level stuff and, and I understand a lot. And I had an idea to start writing a blog and doing some experiments, measuring performance under, under various, various, uh, various loads, various circumstances. And um, after some time, I start, I was I, I got approached by this company called Appentra who for creating their own like um, um, software that's you it's called Parallel Analyzer and it's software that people who are interested in performance can use to speed up their hmm. code automatically or through, through recommendations. So they were approached me and asked me if they want if they want me they want me to start working for them as a performance specialist. So I joined them and then that's the where the story started. So that's when I started the company. In the meantime, um, there was a few times I helped other people with, uh, with not the Appentra, other people who had also performance problems. I helped them solve them and it's moving in the right direction. So it's enjoyable. It's really nice when you know your expertise and when you can solve problems that maybe a typical engineering would take like two months to solve and you can solve them in a few days or maybe even a few hours. So it's a it's an enjoyable endeavor, and I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying it. I'm learning all all, all the times. I'm, I'm learning new stuff. I'm helping other people 
and I'm also uh, helping the community. So I'm writing posts on this blog. So these are not like short posts. They have a lot of content. It takes me time to, to, to write them. But yeah, it's moving in the nice direction. I like it. I don't believe I've ever heard uh, the job title performance specialist before. That's, I think, a new one to us here. Um, it's, I mean, the, you need to give you, so how, how would you describe what I'm doing? Yeah, I mean, it, it makes sounds sense. like an accurate title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, normally, uh, this type of work will be cons uh, ideally, I, I would like consultant to do consultant work. So not uh, working on a study project for a for a single company. I want to work. Uh, I want to work with uh, several companies and help them in, in a limited time span, maybe five, ten days, twenty days stops to help them. For example, either with debugging or maybe writing some performance critical software, giving advice, uh, trainings, anything like that, that is performance related and I can, that I know well and that I can help with. Uh, so that's that's classical, that's something called consulting. You would work as a consultant. The problem nowadays is that people use the word consulting for meaning something else. It's a, just a contractor. So if a firm, uh, hire, uh, if you go to a firm and you hire 20 engineers, they're called a consultancy, but they don't have the expertise. They're just general general purpose developers. So it's, it's not the same, but the, the terms get you the term gets used uh, differently. Yeah, yeah I know that's I, I like that because you're, you're setting uh, right out the gate. You're, you're setting expectations. You're saying this is what I do and don't expect me to do anything else, basically, in, in a sense, in a good way, because you're limiting it to the things that you're interested in doing. Yes, yes, and uh, the customer, the client, on the other hand, what he gets is he gets, uh, I mean, uh, he gets uh, good bang for his buck. So I can typically debug. I can typically debug problems that most of the engineers don't know they they exist. They exist. I know a lot of, for example, fancy that data structure and how to customize them so you get two or three times better performance and so on. So if you have a problem with your software, you cannot ship it. So it's a good, it may be a good idea to talk to me and maybe I can help. It's a, interestingly, um, a company that I was at a couple of weeks ago was I think the first time ever that they didn't have performance in their list of like top three or four uh, concerns and writing C++. They were much more concerned about like best practices and correctness, which, you know, I'm, I'm cool, I'm on board with that. But um, it did just make me wonder now, as you were talking, like what industries do you find come to you for performance help? So uh, performance is a complex topic. And uh, I, I explicitly said that if application performance, so it's, it's part of the performance where you set up your uh, your, your operating system so it works under high load. For example, a good example is uh, Brandon Gregg, uh, who is wrote that book. Uh, it's called uh, it's called it's uh, system performance. Mm -hmm. So okay. that's one part of the performance. The other one is design for performance. So when you're designing your software, for example, you don't want to have components that talk a lot with with one another. So that's related to performance because every time there is a talk, maybe it goes through the network and then you lose some time. But there is also on the level of one component how it works how it works out. For example, um, so now my my typical clients and the, the people I'm talking to are people who actually uh, do some kind of it's they're not like um, for example let me give an example image processing video processing audio processing uh, uh, game developers uh, machine learning uh, machine learning communities for example speech recognition uh, computer vision. Internet of Things, so where they have these small devices which need to be fast. So these are my, mm. my target audience. Um, sometimes, uh, sometimes the the talk about performance starts at the design, but I cannot, as a consultant, I cannot fix those problems because they require that several teams cooperate. The, the inter inter so different components that require different teams to cooperate. So I don't fix those stuff. I just work on a level of one component. So do, does it ever happen? I, we're probably getting off track from you know our, our plan here, but whatever. Uh, does it ever happen that um, a company brings you in and you say you look at their stuff and you say, "I'm sorry, but it's going to take a re-architecture of your system to get the performance that you need." Uh, so uh, normally, no. 
because uh, because the type of people that contact me um, they so when you start working on performance you have a you, you have to have a repro so okay. and normally people are uh. the people are uh, when, when when it comes to performance uh, the the writers of the algorithms them, themselves they know that they're doing redundant work so they're doing something that they need to do they know how to fix this stuff but on a lower level there are some problems that they don't know for example they don't know how to use computer hardware in an efficient manner and we'll talk about that later so that's one of the things where i can help okay performance is about um, when you when you get uh, when you, so normally you want to write code that is portable that is easy to read and that's i mean that all the code should be written like that but sometimes that's not enough if you have a low embedded chip and you want to ship your product but if that means that you need to pay instead of two dollars for a chip three dollars then for hundred thousand chips you lose hundred thousand dollars so in that case you're willing to do uh, those low level optimization that are that are maybe for one chip only or for one family of chips and uh, you're willing to make some sacrifices right so if I understand, you're saying your clients tend to come with to you saying, we have this specific problem, we know how to reproduce it, we need this thing faster, smaller, whatever, and you say, I got you. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Uh, could we maybe go into a little bit more detail about like the types of performance improvements you usually wind up making that could be you know, useful to some of our listeners, maybe something they're not aware of that they should look out for? Uh, I mean, the topic of C++ performance is a huge topic and sure. the way that the, I mean, the writers of the STL library, when they were writing the library, they were writing a library that should be used. STD map should work correctly for map, which has 10 entries and which has 1 million entries and STD tree should work, uh, under this, uh, under this and this. So they're covering a huge, a huge array of possibilities. Now, um, C++ code most of the time works correctly, but sometimes you need to find, let's say, fine tune it. Fine tune it. Sometimes there are just typical bugs. For example, uh, somebody forgot to set up the initial bucket count for a hash list, and it initializes for a long time. Okay, but sometimes it's like um, you need a, a data structure, an allocator, and those things do too needs to work in a really specific way in order to get the peak performance. I mean, for example, one let, let's say like this, one decision that was made in C++ is that the STD map is a red-black tree, mm -hmm. which is the binary tree. But binary trees are not that good for performance because of the data cache misses. If your tree, if you have like a binary tree with um, five, four, for example, instead of two, if you have four values in one node, that means that uh, you will have less cache misses because the tree is shallow, shallower. On the benefit side, also additional is that uh, that um, uh, the, the good thing also about this is that the um, data is fetched from the memory in blocks of 64 bytes, typically 64 bytes, and uh, you're you're bringing memory uh, data to the CPU, but you're not not wasting memory bandwidth. So you're not wasting data on just bringing stuff that you will never use. If you focus on this, if you understand how this works, it, it can have a really good impact on performance. Okay. One of the things I uh, seems to be coming up, but maybe I'm misunderstanding what's going on sometimes, but uh, you know, I, I had a computer science curriculum in 1996 is when I started, graduated in 2000. And I feel like in so many cases, you mentioned this red black tree, like from a computer science, like big O notation, kind of whatever, we're like, oh, well, clearly a linked list, you know, is going to be better performance if you need to do X and Y, because that's less moving memory around. And I feel like a lot of the things that I was taught just don't hold true on modern hardware. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, there are, depending on what you studied, so there's computer science and computer engineering and software engineering, but computer science, they use the linked lists a lot. And then you have graduates that say, but why don't we use linked lists everywhere? I mean, linked list as a data structure, if it's huge, 
<laughs> again, there is a lot of, let's say an example of linked list, it's a nice example because we can talk about it and we understand what's going on. So right. each element of the linked list is one call to the allocator, right? So if you have 10,000 elements, you'll have 10,000 calls to the allocator. So the allocator is actually your memory gets fragmented. It does, this doesn't happen with vector. So that's one thing. So just the problem of memory allocator. The next thing is that when you're traversing linked list, you're actually the referencing pointers. Now, if you make a setup, a set, you, you make a test environment where you have a where you have compare vector with uh, with uh, linked list, and you say oh, they're almost the same. Maybe linked list is a bit slower, but they're mostly the same. But what happens is that in your little environment, when every call to malloc will return the next chunk in memory. So you basically have continuous mm. parts of memory. But in a real world system, when a lot of things happen, th there is no guarantee that will happen. And worst, worst, if you need to traverse a vector or need to traverse the linked list at the same time, worst case scenario for linked list can be 10 times slower than the vector because of the data cache misses. I wonder like how often, uh, yeah, I know you said sometimes it's relatively simple things that you have to solve. How often do you come in and you're like, um, why are you using only linked list here? Let's just go ahead and fix that real quick. That, that, I mean, programmers as always make errors and so on, but that doesn't happen often, but it's, an, uh, it's a good example to, the, to, to illustrate the problem on modern hardware that most people don't even think about it. So you say, okay, I need a data structure where I can remove elements, elements randomly, linked list will do, okay? And then what happens? I mean, why is this slow? And the people in um, and the people in um, game development they they have a different data structure. It's called Colony. I don't know, probably mm -hmm. heard about it. So yeah. it's a data structure that uh, it's vector based, but you can uh, add remove elements. The, the the data structure is unsorted, but it will guarantee you a good performance uh, for the data caches, and it will also guarantee that you can quickly insert or remove element without any without any problems. And they use this data structure, and this data structure is, is as far as I know, is currently being standardized. Standardized. Yeah, I think it was probably, what, four years ago or something, we had Matt Bentley on, I believe, to talk about his colony proposal, and Still it's been a long time early. coming. Yeah. yeah. C++ is not in a hurry. It exists for 25 <laughs> years. It will exist for some time more. Yeah. <laughs> So you, you gave a, a whole talk at CPV Now, which I think I mentioned um, that you were there recently uh, on why we should be a, a avoiding dynamic memory allocation for performance improvements. Uh, it's something we kind of talk about a little bit on the show fairly often, but maybe you want to go in a little bit more detail and kind of remind our listeners why uh, dynamic memory should be you know, not so allocated as much as possible. So the, the, the problem with dynamic memory is that um, there are several problems with dynamic memory. You have the mm -hmm. first, you have the problem of memory fragmentation. And as your system is running, it gets slower and slower. If you're just allocating, releasing, allocating, releasing memory, it will get slower, slower, slower. And you can even measure that if you have a long, long running embedded system. They have even this, this, uh, this catch to fix, uh, to fix embedded, uh, to fix uh, memory fragmentation slowness by restarting restarting the system. For example, your your television box at three o'clock in the morning will, re, will restart. Maybe you're not aware of that. Mine reta, restarts at 3, 3.18. So every time you turn it on in the morning, you see, in the morning, you see 3.18. Now, uh, that's one of the ways, I mean, that's a really creative way to solve it. it it's, a, it's a nice way to solve it. And creativity is all about software. I heard, for example, that in the, uh, so I'm not, uh, this is what I heard. So this is, don't take it, like a true, take with a grain of salt, but in the airplane uh, airplane industry, they have components like small, so you have embedded chips, you have many of them, and they can restart within like 15 milliseconds, but they also can restart. And this is the, these, these things are safe to, to, to use and, and, and uh, to use in this life critical situation. So this is the way how to fix issues. Now, the problem again with the allocation is that you have memory fragmentation, that's one. So you're calling a lot of, uh, calling a lot of, allocate, calling allocate a lot of times that creates problem. Then when you do it like this, if you're allocating smaller chunks of memory, that will probably mean that you will jump around memory, which results in data cache misses. Now, if you have like binary trees, 
are binary trees and so trees and std map and std set and std linked list are notorious because they allocate for each for each data they will for each node they will allocate one chunk and if you have huge data structure they can allocate a, a huge amount of data ch chunks now i mean maps std map exists for a reason you want to quickly fetch the data but sometimes you don't want that stress. So if you use a custom allocator, for example, you're limiting, you're allocating from a dedicated pool. And that means that when the data structure is destroyed, you can get rid of the get rid of the um, of the block of memory that you allocated your data from. And you don't have any memory fragmentation. And all your data is local, so it increases data hash hit rate. So it works better. So custom allocation strategies to give one big block of memory that you then know you can allocate from a contiguous chunk. Yeah, so uh, there are two types of allocators, the STL standard allocator. In that case, for example, if you have several instances of STD map, they will all like allocated from one large block. But on the other hand, there are per instance allocators. So each instance gets its own allocator. That makes sense. For example, if you have a huge binary tree, a huge uh, tree in a, a, a for for a in a database, like in memory database. In that case, it makes sense to have a dedicated block for each instance. Uh, that will keep data locality at bay. It decreases data cache uh, miss rate, TLB miss rate, so it works faster. Out of curiosity, do you ever uh, use the PMR allocators from C++ 17? Uh, uh, those are, um, no, I haven't, I know what they are. I haven't used them. Uh, so I found out about them quite late and I already had uh, most, I already covered most of the things that I was interested in. So, so I didn't have an opportunity to use them. Sure. It, it is like uh, PMR allocators are like, they're, they're not well known. I mean, you mm -hmm. need to dig them. I mean, you don't hear about them. You, you you don't have an idea what they are capable of, what are their limitations, so on. So they're they're just like something you put in the on the side and it waits there. I don't know why it's like that. Part of the problem is uh, Clang's lib C plus plus still doesn't have PMR implemented from C plus plus seventeen. Yeah, I, I have definitely. a little bit of a sore spot with a few C++ 17 features that haven't been implemented yet. That's one of them. Oh, <laughs> um, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, different ways of uh, uh, some some techniques used by game developers. Um, I think we've done a you know interview a long time ago with some game developers talking about like data oriented design. Is that something you advocate for as a you know potential performance improvement? So uh, I personally don't have a lot of experience with data oriented design because I never worked in a game development. So it's not even game development; it's a game engine development. Mm -hmm. Most, as as you said, Jason, most people nowadays don't use C plus plus for game development. <laughs> which was also a surprise to me. Um, what happens is that, um, again, in game development, if you're not running at 30 frames per second, uh, your game cannot chip. And then you need to think about performance from day one. So they, through trial and error, they devised a new way of thinking about performance. Now the game developer, uh, game development is a specific kind of development. They have these worlds with huge amount of objects, and they need to render them 30 times per second. So they need to change their states 30 times per second. Now what they're doing is they they got rid of polymorphism, and they're doing type-based processing. So they first they, there there is no like a base class that uh, like uh, object in a game. Then you have a player. Then you have a gun, and so on. They have their first processing, uh, first processing uh, guns. Then they're processing uh, people, game character. They're processing cars and so on. So this has an advantage because it uses CPU hardware more efficiently. There is a lack of instruction caches. You can keep all these components in uh, vectors. You don't have to. Uh, it saves memory because, for example, STD uh, variant doesn't save memory. So it saves memory, and the system is generally more responsive. So uh, according to them, it's like four or five times faster than if you take a standard object-oriented approach. But um, again, they're working in a specific environment. It's 
I'm not sure if it's possible if it's possible to do, to implement a game uh, to implement a, um, a compiler using data driven design. Uh, so I'm just curious. I, uh, the people in game community they're like a small sect because not a lot of it leaks out. So yeah. Uh, Type-based processing is a good idea. If you have a performance problems, you should definitely look at that side. So you don't want to you want to sort all your objects per type and then you process them. That keeps the instruction caches warm and generally the system is more responsive. This reminds me um, of your C now talk, which I, I watched part of, but you're talking about um, avoiding vectors of pointers in there. And it sounds like a similar topic. Is that something you want to discuss? Yeah, sure. So again, uh, pointers, vector. So C++, when it was invented, the polymorphism was done through pointers. So that means if you have a vector of 1 million objects, you need to have 1 million, million call, calls to malloc. That creates memory fragmentations problem. That creates slows down. It doesn't use memory efficient, efficiently, as we already explained. Now, what happens is that. Um, what happens is that you also get data cache misses. In the 90s, that wasn't that such a big of a problem, but now it is. Now, um, using alternatives, for example, again, type-based processing. If you, you can use unsorted containers, then you should have std vector for each type. That's the perfect way to do it. You, in that case, you don't, get, uh, you, you don't need virtual functions. And uh, the compiler is better optimizing because it can inline stuff. Uh, what else? You're using memory more efficiently, so, and the the the, the program will will um, will um, be happy about it. So the performance will be good. Now, if you cannot do that because you need sorted containers, then you should try std variant. Now, the problem with this std variant is you have one large object and all the other are smaller. Then you're using a lot of memory. Right. But again, performance is uh, when you're done to that level. So there are some like general guidelines about performance and there, there are specific things when you are inspecting and seeing what's going on. So sometimes you can change things, other times you cannot. So vector shared pointers is a um, vector shared pointers, vectors of pointers are generally bad for performance because they suffer potentially from many data cache misses. And if you compare them with vectors of objects and vector of pointers, you can sometimes see like, again, improvement in speed of up to 10 times. But you also mentioned virtual function calls just now. Do you, do you feel like uh, object-oriented design in C++ is kind of mm, counter to performance? Object-oriented design as a paradigm, uh, so C as a programming language was like a high-level assembly. It was uh -huh. that how it, conce it was conceived. C++ introduced object-oriented paradigm, but the paradigm itself doesn't have anything to do with hardware. So it doesn't have anything to do with hardware. It doesn't, there are no concept of class in hardware. In, in hardware, you have integer, you have character, you have double. So there is no class. Next thing is, um, next thing is you don't have, uh, uh, virtual functions are just like function pointers where each of these can, can point to a different, to a different functions, to a, to a different function. So this is the essence is a virtual function. Now, in 2021 20, hardware, uh, you have the problem, the problem, uh, if you're changing the function you're calling, you're iterating things through a container, then you're calling this function, then the other function, the other function, then the other function. They're all different functions. The instruction cache in your CPU has a limited capacity. And the current, the function uh, you're currently executing um, evicts the, the, the code from the previous function. So you're always running code that is never in the instruction cache. That's one thing. The predi branch predictors are always cold because you're always running a new code. So that's mm. a second thing that's, that's a second thing that's bad. Now the problem of pointer, that's the third thing. So. The virtual functions are not bad by themselves, but the way they are used to typically can create a lot of performance problems. And that's why the people in game development and also um, uh, high frequency trading communities development, they are avoiding them as, as possible. Interesting. 
One uh, design idea that I've kind of thought sounded interesting, and I don't know where I may have heard or first thought of this idea, uh, but I've also never seen it put in use, would be like kind of a hybrid approach where you you do use the object-oriented hierarchy, but you prefer having vectors of specific types. So then if you need to, you can still pass this, you know, generic thing with a virtual function call interface somewhere and use it that way. But otherwise you prefer processing your vectors of known types and avoiding those costs. I'm just curious if that's an idea that you've seen and if that works or not. Yes, yes. So th that's an idea that that, that 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 can work. So for people who are suffering so from performance issues, that's a, an, an idea that can actually help. Oh, okay. That's cool. Modern CPU is designed, for example, to effectively do video processing or audio processing because those that, that data is laid out in vectors. That data is laid out in vectors, and each element of the vector is a simple type. And computers are really good at these things. When you do it like that, you can count on vectorization. So this is a vector vector instructions. The CPU can process more than one data in in a single instruction, like four doubles or eight doubles, and so on. And the the CPU is the computer is actually designed to do this this kind of software. And actually, if you think about it. Most of the things that your computer is running now is doing some kind of video processing, audio processing, uh, displaying, uh, displaying uh, uh, your browser. So it, it is actually doing that kind of stuff. But for example, imagine a software, general purpose C++ software with classes. Now class itself doesn't translate well to what CPU does. So what, what kind of CPU, the task that CPU actually go, is good at it. So in that case, in that case, you can uh, you can expect some s slowness. Now, for example, does the class size you're processing objects, and does the class size influence performance? So that's the question. Now the answer is yes, and it's quite dramatically. Uh, normally, if you go if your class is 128 bytes and increase it by two, you can expect a lo loss of performance by so it, it will run like. 0.7, 0 0.6, so it will run 50 or 60 percent times slower. Now, what happens is what happens is that so we, as I already told you, the data is moved from the CPU to memory in the blocks of 64 bytes. Now, on modern CPUs, this is called memory wall, and the CPU has to wait for the data. Data cache misses are extremely expensive in the modern CPUs, so they take like. 300 cycles to complete. That's 300 instructions that you could use. And that's the time that you could use better. Now, what you need to know is that inside the class, if you're processing a class and it's on a hot path, you, if you remove everything from the class that is not related to that processing, all the data members, if you remove them out of the class and put them on some, somewhere else, you will increase the speed. Why? Because the CPU is not transferring data to, from memory to the, to, to the CPU that actually is not used. And you get better speed. Keeping everything is vect in vectors of objects, not vector of pointers, is also one way to make it faster. OK? So that's mm -hmm. also one way to make it faster. For a typical C++ developer, type-based processing, when you are just processing all objects by types, is also one way to make it faster. By the way, I was surprised that C++ doesn't have like a multi-vector container, which is really easy to, to write. So you, it's a vector which can hold several types, but internally each type gets its own vector. And then you can use templates to do all kind of all kind of uh, all kind of data manipulation on this on this. Hmm. Uh, yeah. So they don't have it. It's it's not a big deal to write it, but it's nice when you have it as part of the library and it. Uh, enforces this nice development, at least from the performance, but nice development ways of thinking. So so these are the things that actually do matter with performance. And C++ is not the best about that. Even though it claims to be a really like a language for high performance. I'm curious, you mentioned um, vectorization. How often can you actually rely on the compiler to vectorize your simple data processing stuff? Um, so vectorization, oh, that's, um, okay, that's again another story. 
It depends on the compiler. GCC right. and Flash follow each other in that regard. So I did the research for Appentra just today, this morning, and GCC and Clang are mostly close to another. Intel has a compiler, a compiler that is better at vectorizing, and there it is often using high-performance environments. But that compiler is not really C++, fully C++ compliant. People are complaining about bugs and so on. So it's not typically used a lot. Now, if you have like a simple processing, so you can rely on vectorization for the compiler to vectorize your code automatically. A certain pre-assumptions have to be uh, have to be made. First, you need to have vectors of simple types, integer, chars, doubles, and so on. No classes. If it's mm -hmm. with classes, it doesn't work. Because of the memory inefficiencies, uh, the, the vectorization doesn't pay off and the compilers don't do it. Now, if you have a class and you want it vectorized, then you can move from that array of structures to structure of arrays. So there is that. that's one way to do it. Now, when you have simple classes and you're iterating over vectors, you need to iterate over your vector linearly. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or the other way around. You cannot skip elements like 0, 2, 4. The compilers don't vectorize typically well that code. So that's the second presumption. Next, you have a for loop. While loops, they don't vectorize that well. Inside for loop has to have, before you start your for loop, you need to know exactly how, much, how many iteration will it have. So you cannot change the, 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 the trip count of the loop depending on the data. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, one thing for the compiler to be able to vectorize your loop properly. Next, inside the loop, you cannot leave the loop like with break, with goat, or with break. If you do it, it doesn't vectorize, or it vectorizes poorly. Next, inside the loop, you don't have to have, you should not have conditional conditional processing. If you have conditional processing, that means this, this element has to be processed with these instructions, and the other element has to be processed with the other instructions, so you cannot do this bulk processing four by four or eight by eight. So these are all the conditions. If you fulfill all of these, then you typically the compiler will be, will be able to vectorize it efficiently. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna I'm going to uh, I'm gonna ask a more specific question, which I think maybe falls a little bit into the category of trying to get free consulting advice here. Okay. <laughs> uh, but the project that I'm working on, um, there's loops that they know are being vectorized. Mm -hmm. because they verify this with, you know, compiler warnings and stuff and looking at the assembly. And some people in the organization are saying, well, let's change everything that we're doing from double to float, because then instead of getting four-way vectorization, we'll get eight-way vectorization. Okay. And, uh, and they're expecting, you know, a, a measurable performance impact. And I'm just curious if you would expect a measurable performance impact in that case. Yes, yes. Um, okay. There are several reasons, so th there is not only one reason. So the first thing is that uh, you get double memory bandwidth. So your vector is two times smaller. Right. And it's faster. So if you're processing single double of float, doesn't matter. But if you're processing a vector of floats, it should be faster. So the other thing is if you have a fast math enable. So this is a compiler flag called fast math, and then it enables some kind of um, some kind of um, approximate instructions that are faster. If your code is using square roots or divisions, it will work faster. Mm. But uh, it will work faster, but it will it will be less precise. Right. So yeah. So it, you should expect you should expect performance improvement when you switch from doubles to floats. Hmm. Interesting. When you first start looking at you know a piece of code that need some performance improvement. Are you looking at the code itself or do you use any you know tools to try to find uh, places where performance could be improved? So again, often it happens that the the performance uh, improvement doesn't come from doesn't come from um, it doesn't come from uh, the any hardware tricks and so on. Mm -hmm. If you do less work, you will get performance improvement. And sometimes the people who wrote the algorithms are actually the one that should know that. But for some reason, they just forget. When I come to that kind of problem, uh, for me, it's, it takes time to, to ramp up and to understand what the code is doing. So, I mean, everybody has that problem. For example, one of the ways to improve performance is to have duplicate 
du duplicate memory. If you have like a class which is shared among with, uh, with pointers to two classes, and it is essential in both cases, you can have a copy of that class, class in two places. The normalization in database. You avoid uh, pointer referencing, you're avoiding data cache messes, okay? So, so that is the way how, uh, how to do it. Now, there are tools that you can use to check for the hardware efficiency. If the data structure is how data structure algorithm hardware efficient, how is it hardware efficient? Now, the best tool it is, it's Intel Vitium and Intel uh, um, uh, Advisor. So they're the best tools on the market. Unfortunately, they work only on Intel CPUs. Right. Uh, they can tell you if a loop is vectorized, they can detect memory inefficiencies and so on. Next thing is uh, that I also like, it's called Liquid. Liquid, it's like a library. It's used in high performance world and you can take your, you can mark your code base with, they have this marker API and then you can see data cache misses and so on. This thing works on Intel, but it works on AMD and ARM also. AMD and ARM, AMD especially, it's not really well supported. So you need to, to dig into that uh, and, and see what's going on. Now, the thing that I have now currently is that uh, uh, by just looking at the code, I can guess if it has suffers mostly from data cache misses from 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 um, vector poor vectorization or maybe it's it's branch prediction misses that stuff of course you cannot like false sharing you cannot detect that you need tools but yes these really that comes up uh, these types of problems that come up often I can just by looking at the code I can see if there is a problem I know what to expect I know how data structures behave I know how the compiler does its like auto vectorization Okay, well, Avitza, it was great having you on the show today. Is there anything else you want to tell our listeners about before we let you go? I don't know. Performance is fun. So, uh, too bad not many people do it exclusively. Um, there is this guy, Denis Bakhvalov, who is uh, who is writer for easyperf.net. And we are starting up. Um, we are starting up a um, performance challenge really soon in a few days. Mm. So people who are eager to try to do performance optimizations with other people. So it's like a contest, but not really because you need to cooperate with other people and exchange it. It's, it's a fun as an experience, really fun. And uh, people are should really uh, should, should join and take, take part. I mean, there are no prizes except for participation and the, the, the knowledge you get home. So this knowledge is hard paid knowledge because it's paid in, in, in sweat. <laughs> uh, how do they That's find it. this? Sorry. Sorry? Yeah, did you say easyperf.net? Is that where they should go? Yeah, you can follow me on my blog. So mm -hmm. there will be, I guess there will be links in the, I will yeah. also post it, right. but I'm not the host. Dennis is the host. I will post a notification or you can, you can go to his easyperf.net and you can there you can you can subscribe to his mailing list so he will he's he will be giving out uh call he will he will be sending a call to for for for, for, for the contents in, in in a matter of days so probably when this when this episode gets published it will be out okay okay very cool it was great having you on the show today Vita. Thank you very much. It was really nice. I hope I, I didn't talk too much, and I hope it was interesting for your uh, for your. That's great. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Take care. Bye.
Um, yes, um, yes, you can do that, but uh, you, you certainly can uh, have that output, you know, as you are running your cache to test, you can basically take that output and then pass it to uh, to the Tuka server. Uh, oh. So in this case, you are integrating the Tuka client library with your te unit test right. you know, uh, executable. So that's possible. Um, and I think I like that approach more than having your output stored in a file and then later have a separate kind of uh, process for submitting sure. that output. Right. Um, and can Tuka tell you that, you know, some numbers trending down or trending up or yes. staying flat? Okay. Yes. Um, so uh, I guess at this point, the um, the analytics that we provide for the behavioral differences is a slightly more mature uh, and, you know, um, more helpful than for the performance. However, um, Tuka can show uh, in its UI the trends of differences for different you know, functions uh, over different versions of the code. And I have found it very helpful uh, because usually, you know, you want to look at a chart and see that over time, uh, your, you know, tiny little code changes kind of amount to a performance hiccup uh, or, you know, uh, a slowdown in yeah. a, a piece of workflow. So uh, all it does right now, uh, the, the interface is just giving you a chart, uh, uh, you know, showing you, um, how how the performance uh, changes over uh, different versions? For many things, that's that's good enough. Yeah. Yes, I I think that might be um, enough for people to find value. But uh, I have much higher ambitions <laughs> in uh, in terms of how to make it more helpful for users. In this case, I really think that performance um, tracking performance is slightly more tricky than behavior because. Uh, it usually has some noise. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It is not guaranteed to stay exactly the same. So you want to have a way of um, looking at the performance changes as a human being uh, looks at it, right? We, we look at a chart, we say, oh, well, this dropped 1% uh, or two for this particular version. But we don't care as long as this is not consistent over you know, a few versions. Right. Should we talk more about like the actual Tuka, you know, website interface and and what that process is like? I, I did watch one of the videos you put up that was uh, linked to that article two weeks ago. Awesome. Um, yes. So um, again, I think the plat. So the the Tuka server um, helps you not just store your results, but also compares them against different versions. Mm -hmm. Now, the comparison uh, certainly has some output in the, the, the differences. So the, uh, the server attempts to visualize those differences. And uh, the, the visualization of those differences is something you can look at uh, for each given version. As your test is being executed, you can go uh, you know, have a look. But then after all the test cases are executed, the uh, server is going to send uh, a notification to members of your team and say, hey, this particular version that you just ran has uh, these differences. So mm -hmm. that report that it generates is more high level uh, mm -hmm. because it wants it's meant to be consumed uh, by everyone uh, to give them an insight into how the, you know this particular version has behaved. So that you can look at that email or a Slack notification and say, well, this is not this is not what we expected. So let's go take a look. But in some cases you may make intentional changes to the software, uh, in which case you would use the platform again. You go there, you click a button and say, this, from now on, this is the version uh, that, you know, that I trust, that my right. software should behave from now on. So um, that is also kind of automated, the, the way that all this, these versions are basically tracked. Uh, you can add comments uh, to kind of communicate with your team members and then have audit logs for how your software is evolving over time. Yeah, do I need to inform the Tuka server that I'm going to add some new variable or value, or can I just do that nope. ad hoc? Okay. You can do that ad hoc, yeah. In fact, you can uh, do that with test cases as well. You can add uh, you know, as many test cases as you want at any one time. Um, 
The advantage of having this uh, remote test server is that it is aware of the test cases that are part of your baseline version, right? So right. Uh, the advantage for that is you can then not have your test cases listed as you're running the test. So uh, a normal Tuka test um, code doesn't specify its test cases because the when, when you have access to the library, the library can query the list of test cases from the server. And therefore, you don't have expected values and you don't have the list of test cases. All you have in that regression test code is how you run your, uh, your workflow under test and then what data you want to capture. OK. OK. Uh, I don't think we've mentioned yet what uh, platforms, compilers are supported. Yes, um, so the C++ uh, client library for uh, Tuka has uh, support for uh, all platforms. So the, well, all known pro uh, commonly used platforms, Mainly. right? Windows, Windows Linux, Linux, Linux and So yes, it can work one. on my Commodore 64 code <laughs> that I've been, uh, no, I'm just... I am very, yeah, I am regretting to say <laughs> having said that. But, but in general, uh, I've basically, I think, um, because the end users might be using code bases that are somewhat dated, I wanted to support you know, a wide range of compiler versions, yeah. a wide range of standards. So uh, starting C++11, um, it kind of covers um, you know, the relatively recent versions of the C++ uh, <laughs> standard. Um, and then uh, the compilers, I think uh, GCC uh, 8, and Clang uh, 8 are both supported, um, as well as MSVC. Um, I think uh, for 20, 2013 about, um, yeah. is supported, oh, wow. which is okay. giving me a lot of headache, to be honest. Yeah, <laughs> so I don't I You might drop it. No. Yes. You might drop it going is, forward. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I think 2015 would even cover most of the uh, current um, console dev kits, actually. That's right. However, um, the so because this uh, started as a side project and then kind of obtained for as an internal tool at the my former employer, I had to make it possible for us to use it with you know the most outdated codes that we had, which happened to be using MSVC 13. So. <laughs> okay, so I, I feel like I well should ask this, or I'm, I'm very curious. Anyhow, you mentioned in your bio that you recently left your former employer to pursue this, and then you've also just publicly said that you began development of this project at your former employer. So you That's left right. with their blessing, I assume, to... Yes. So for <laughs> our listeners, um, yeah, so when... So at least in the US, uh, I think the norm is that when you uh, start working somewhere, uh, are your future I, you know, IP, developed IP would belong to the company that you are working for. Right. And that seems a little weird for others, but uh, here we all understand that. Now, the, uh, the problem was because this was started when I was working at uh, my employer, so uh, I, I Basically, I had to work on it only at nights and weekends. Um, but then, because I was so obsessed with it, and everybody knew that I'm working on it for so long, um, they all had my, you know, kind of their blessing. Uh, so I got the IP rights, and that's uh, only when I uh, was able to start uh, speaking with people um, and uh, showing the product to them outside the company. Oh, and the way you had described it, I thought that you had actually started development on this on the company's dollar, which would have the they would own it, I think, in pretty much any country if that had been the case. That's right. Yes. <laughs> yes. But this was a side project. Uh, and for me, it was very important uh, to kind of separate the work that I am uh, doing for this project with all the uh, other work that I do uh, for the company, you know, right. tasks. Okay. Um, so that's cool. Yeah. You said you've been working on this, I think, for two or three months, uh, kind of on your own. Um, Full time. That's yeah. Right. How well has that been going? Like, are you getting like funding? Do you have um, users? No, I don't have funding yet, uh, okay. and I'm not seeking funding right now. I'm uh, I'm seeking my first ten customers, uh, ten paying okay. customers, I should say. Mm -hmm. um, I have um, since leaving uh, 
you know, Wydal, I have now about 10 active uh, individual users um, that are using the uh, product uh, on a weekly basis. Now, um, there are also a couple engineering teams uh, that, you know, are evaluating the product uh, for larger scale use uh, in their organizations. Um, now, I still don't have any paying customer and um, I'm, I'm actively working on uh, finding my first time. Um, I want to say right now that my, my primary objective is to get uh, as much feedback as I can from right. actual people who have this problem, the problem that we had at my company. Um, so the conversations I've had with uh, software engineers over the past three, uh, four months has been extremely uh, interesting, uh, just to find that we all are suffering from the same issues uh, is kind of giving me, uh, you know, goosebumps. Uh, but in general, it's, al it's also very motivating in terms of, you know, the possibilities of improving what uh, can be improved in terms of how we maintain software at large scale. Right. Well, so if, if listeners are interested in trying out the project and you know, becoming a, a user, paying or otherwise, you know, what kind of options are there? So right now the platform, uh, so I should say that the remote Tuka server can be deployed on premise as well okay. as a cloud hosted version. So the cloud hosted version is deployed at Tuka.io. Um, listeners and uh, anyone who is interested can actually go create an account for free. They can use the uh, client libraries for C++ uh, and Python. Um, to submit test results. So everything is free uh, right now. But uh, once they want to use it for like uh, teams of up to say uh, more than five uh, members, then right now there is a pricing plan, uh, but it's still like, I, I don't want it to be a blocker. I want mm -hmm. to kind of just have users that are using the product and not worry about paying. So. Um, in general, everything right now is uh, as free as it can be. And I'm going to keep the uh, free plan for the Tuka.io uh, platform, uh, you know, forever permanent. Um, so there's always a way of, uh, you know, working uh, and getting value out of this product without paying anything. Okay, very cool. So like I mentioned before, the project I'm working on already has a regression solution that does work. Uh, so I don't know if we would be interested for this, for this particular, um, for, for that problem with your solution. But I am like really needing to start tracking more statistics like binary size, bloaty output, like, you know, ABI diffs, that kind of thing. Can I use the Python interface to push those things in a meaningful way to... Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it was two weeks ago when you mentioned that uh, on a right. podcast. And uh, it's, it's interesting that um, it was the first time that I was thinking of this, you know, being a possible use case. And therefore I was interested enough to try it with the new uh, client library for Python. Uh, so I'm calling the, um, you know, ABI diff and then getting the output and submitting it uh, to the platform. It's very um, simple. So by the time that this uh, podcast is released, I'm hopeful that I can have a, um, you know, a GitHub repository uh, that is public that shows, you know, how to do this um, so that, you know, anyone who is interested can try. Awesome. <laughs> very cool. Okay, well, uh... Where should listeners go if they want to go and, and try out Tuka, Peshman? I would recommend uh, that they start with Tuka.io. Uh, mm -hmm. There are links there, especially in the documentation to um, GitHub repository for the C++ client library, if they want to start integrating that and then have, uh, getting started. And there are so many different getting started guides uh, in terms of, you know, just if, if they are curious to um, get more information about how, you know, the, the platform works. Okay. Anything else uh, you wanted to tell our listeners about before we let you go, Pejman? Um, well, I just wanted to mention that, you know, this 
project started with a C++ uh, client library. So it's near and dear to my heart in a way. And I feel like uh, the best that I can get out of the C++ community is their advice and feedback. So um, I'd like uh, for our, your listeners to um, see if, you know, um, check out the product uh, and then um, see if they can uh, find it useful or not. And then share their thoughts with me as I'm starting this journey. Um, another thing I wanted to mention is um, for the past uh, three, four years that I've been listening to this podcast, uh, I've been thinking that I would come, if I would ever uh, join you, uh, I would uh, plug the work that you're doing at my former employer now, uh, which is certainly interesting, uh, technically very challenging. And for a C++ engineer, it's the best type of work that I've ever uh, experienced. So um, I'm sure that uh, you're still hiring. And if um, you're interested, looking for a fun challenge, um, check out Vital Images. Vital Images. We've never talked about medical imaging on the show before, but I'm sure there's a lot of C++. You know, I turned down a job that was related to medical imaging because it made me too nervous. What if I got something <laughs> wrong? I didn't want to. I didn't want to kill someone. <laughs> Basically. Yes, but on the flip side, um, writing good code might actually save someone's life. Yeah, yes, so. that's what my wife tells me, but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank Pajma. you again. Yeah. Awesome, thanks for coming on.